in this episode of Unpacked. I always had a feeling of abandonment. I had a gateway emotion. That downer of the ecstasy was the gateway for me to use heroin. I don't understand what is wrong with me. I'm mm. shivering, my muscles are sore, my body is aching. I'm officially an addict. The challenges and experiences of a recovering heroin addict. Some of these stories are extremely dark. Our guest today is here to share. Let's unpack. Merlene Williams is a makeup guru and stylist to the stars. With an impressive list of A-list celebrities, events and shows that she has graced with her work, Merlene's name is in lights. However, no one knows about the darkness that almost took her life. For five years, Merlene was a heroin addict whose life was being swallowed by addiction. And in some other circles, she became known as a pimp. Fortunately, Merlene survived and her journey to recovery continues. This is her story. Let's unpack. Merlene, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Lebo. So let's start at, you know, I want to get my terminology correct. You technically are always in recovery. Always in recovery, but... So you're not recovered. So for me, I always say that I'm in recovery, mm. but heroin is not in the front of my brain. Mm. So it's not in the front of my thoughts, but I always respect addiction mm. and I always understand that um, it is something that I dealt with. Mm -hmm. So take me back to what your life and upbringing was like as a child. As a child, I was born, my, my parents were young parents, so um, they thought it was best for me to be in the care of my grandmother. Yeah, and Gra that's mom's mom. That is my dad's... Dad's mom. ...grandmother oh, okay. and mother. So yes. it was technically my great-grandmother. Mm. Uh, my parents were in Cape Town, and my grandmother, great-grandmother, was living in Oatswain, which is a small town. I grew up in a loving, loving, loving home with mm. principals with my great-grandmother. When I was in primary school, I had to move back to my parents again. Mm. So when I was with my grandmother, I would miss my parents. Mm. And when I was with my parents, I missed my grandmother. Mm. Did it ever get explained to you why you were moving? It was explained to me when I was much older. Mm, but not at the time. But not at the time. Yes. But in both times, I was happy to move because mm. I, I just wanted to be with my parents. Mm, mm, mm. And I think that, you know, the, that was the order of the day back in the day. Even if your parents weren't young, uh, some parents were working. So it was normal for black and brown families to have their kids live with their grandparents. What, what did that make you feel? What did that instill in you? So there was an excellent side to it because my principles... I learned from my grand, from my grandmother and from my great grandmother. Mm. But I always had a feeling of abandonment. Mm. I missed, I missed my foundation. So I missed my great grandmother. I missed my parents. So I actually carried that trauma mm. with me until I was much older. Mm. But I was never aware of it. And I think and correct me if I'm wrong, did you feel like you didn't have stability because you were moving and moving? I had stability. Funny enough, I felt stable when I was with my grandmother, mm. but I missed my parents. I felt stable when I was with my parents because I always wanted to be with my parents, mm. but I missed my grandmother. Mm, mm, mm. I understand what you're saying. So what would you say school was like? Oh, school was beautiful. I was in drama class. I was doing pageants. Um, I had the most amazing friends. I grew up in a small um, town where you were very involved in your community. Mm. So it was beautiful. But I always, always, always had longing. Mm. Do you know what you were longing for? I was longing for my parents. Mm. I wanted to belong to my family. Mm, mm, mm. Did, did, did you as a child, obviously you understand their reasons 
Um, but as a child, did you ever feel that that you may not have been wanted, hence you were moved at the time? Never at all. I always felt wanted. So all these emotions were actually misplaced emotions. Mm. I did not understand it. I just felt like something was missing, mm. but I did not understand what was missing. Mm -hmm. So talk to me then about, you know, your first encounter with any substance, be it alcohol, be it smoking, what was that like? So my encounter with um, alcohol was actually watching some of my family members and some of my peers abusing alcohol and I and I promised myself that I would never ever get involved in in alcohol or drugs. Mm, mm. So up to the point, up to the age that I actually started using drugs, I never drank and I never mm. smoked. Mm. So what age did you get to that then you said, okay, um, something came or let me say that opportunity presented itself that you considered uh, even touching a substance? So what happened for me, I was in a total, total state of unconsciousness. Mm. Um, I was experiencing serious heartache. Mm. So at this point, I'm 23 years old, never mm. drank, never smoked. And um, I went out in a time that I was going through a breakup and somebody presented drugs to me. And I... well, where were you staying at this time? Were you still in Otsuera? No. Now I was in... already in Johannesburg, okay. so I was 23 years old. Yes. So I went out. I was in total darkness, so mm. I was on a very, very, very low. Somebody presented drugs to me, and I was like, sure, I'm going to try it. Mm. Mm. And um, what, was, what was the circumstances of them? Like, were you guys out? What was happening? We were out, but one thing that I realized... You cannot say, I'm trying a drug. Mm. The minute you use the drug, you are already using. Mm. Mm. So what happened was we were out, we were going to go to a party, and um, someone said to me, we're going to take this. We took it, and it was because I had not been intoxicated. In your whole life. In my whole life, it was the most amazing feeling. And what, what drug was it at the time? At the time, it was ecstasy. Mm. Ecstasy was a party drug. Mm. So I have a disclaimer. Even though explaining how the drug makes you feel sounds romantic, mm. you have to understand that the downfall of a drug is very ugly and it's very dark. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it gives you confidence. Um, you only have pos positive perspective about everything. Mm. I can explain it like you would start kissing your enemies mm. because you just feel so damn good. Mm. Mm. So that the what you experienced when you you had that high, and obviously people will use different metaphors, right? You're saying emotionally it would make you feel so damn good. Where did it make you feel like? mentally in terms of processing your thoughts? Were you aware that I'm in an altered state, that this is not real, it's more perception that's been altered? Or did you genuinely like, oh my gosh, life is actually great? You generally feel like life is good. Yeah. So in the moment that you're high, it's never like, oh, I'm in an altered state. You mm. are embodying everything that you're feeling. Mm, mm, mm. So... Um, yeah, you really feel like that's how you feel. So uh, were you around people who were already accustomed to using the substance and did they explain to you what might happen? So at the, when, I, when I used, when I tried ecstasy for the first time, I had actually never met people who's been on ecstasy. Mm. I've never met drug addicts mm. who can explain to me or people that I can actually say, I only saw people who drank alcohol. Mm. And my pers pers perspective of addiction was when you just don't want to stop using it. Okay, yes. I never knew that your brain chemicals actually change. Mm. The minute, the minute. You know, Lebo, the body is so amazing. 
because the minute it detects that you put something foreign in your body, mm. all your chemicals change. Mm. Your body starts adapting to what you're giving it. Mm. That is also the reason why your first high is your best high. Because afterwards your body is now changed. Your body adapts. Mm. Your brain chemicals have changed. And you need more to feel high. Mm, mm, mm. So you have the first high. Um, what was coming down like? Coming down, so there's a big difference between ecstasy mm. and heroin. Mm. Heroin was my drug of choice. Mm. So in short, with ecstasy is when you're coming down, you actually, they actually call it Suicide Tuesday because you feel so low. Mm. Your body is literally depleted of, of all your min minerals and vitamins. Mm. You are thirsty and emotionally you are in depression. Wow. So after you, I mean, because already the ecstasy found you when you were feeling low mm -hmm. and not in a great place in your life. Now you're on this high, you're partying. When the drugs started wearing off, where were you? Were you by yourself? The first time you're taking ecstasy, it takes so long to get out of your system. It mm. literally takes two days before mm. it gets out of your system. So you do not sleep mm. until it is basically leaving your system. But mm. when it leaves your system, your body is so depleted. All your minerals and your vitamins are gone. Mm. Mm. So you awake, but mm. you cannot sleep. Mm. 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 So does it feel like hectic, hectic caffeine? Is your heart racing at the time? When you're high, your, yes. your heart is racing. But when you're on the calm down, you basically just, your mouth is dry. You are thirsty. Mm. You on a low. You feel like you can just kill yourself. Wow, wow. That bad. And I always say, when people ask, what, is the, what was the gateway drug for me? It was, it was actually, I had a gateway emotion. Mm, mm, mm. So... That downer of the ecstasy was the gateway for me to use heroin. Oh, so now you, on this down, you're feeling absolutely low, depressed, over and above having felt that way before. Yes. So what made you then decide, I'm going to try something else? What happened was in a split decision, somebody came and they were like, we need to try this stuff. It's heroin. And it was just me and this person who was trying it at first. Oh, my goodness. Heroin is a downer. Mm. So when I was never injecting it, mm. I was smoking it. Um, I'm going to say what we call it so that for parents out there, if they hear any of these words, they can mm. actually understand and recognize they call it chasing the dragon. Mm. So what we used to do was put it on foil put the powder on top of it, heat the foil, and then smoke it. Mm, mm. What heroin does to you is it hits your brain immediately. You feel like you're in the womb of your mother. Ooh. You have no care. And when people say, how does it make you feel? It actually makes you feel numb. Mm. It makes you not feel. So from the head on your hair to your toes, you are completely numb. Mm. There were moments that I could have a conversation with someone after using and just be static like this. Mm. My mouth will hang open and the spit will literally drew down my mm. mouth. Mm. And I could literally stand there mm. for five minutes. Just mid. Just mid sentence, you yeah. know. You're just feeling this overwhelming feeling of warmth and... After that feeling, you can sleep for two days. Mm. But that is such a contradiction because in the beginning, it makes you sleep. The more you're using it, the more you're getting physically addicted to it. Mm. And then you actually need it. Even more. To feel normal. So now just take me back to, you know, you had said to yourself, I will never, I will never try anything. When you were making the decision to try the heroin, would you say that you were at a part, and again, you, you correctly said you're not trying, you're using. So when you made decision to use, 
was there no voice in your head that said, don't forget you said we're not going to do this? Or were you so down that you didn't even care? It is the latter. Mm. I was so down that I didn't even care. That's why I always say when we're in trauma, the one thing we need to survive trauma, you need to have a little bit of hope. Mm. I was in such trauma that I was totally disconnected from who I really am. Mm. I forgot about my source. I forgot my own promise to myself. And um, f- the bad decisions just spiraled one after mm, the other. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. So now you had your first hit and I'm assuming then you made a conscious decision to just keep trying and trying. What happened with Or you? using and using, let me say doesn't happen like that. It's, yeah. it's, it's, not, it's not so pretty. So yeah. what happens is in a state of unconsciousness, you go and you, you're using, you're starting to use weekends. Then you take the party drug, the ecstasy. So to bring you up. To bring you up. Then when you're going home and you want to sleep, then you're taking the heroin. Mm, mm. So it, you don't feel that depression you basically just sleeping it out. Mm, mm, mm. So what had happened for me is I started using it over time. And, and when you were sober, you weren't thinking to yourself, I shouldn't be doing this. Never met a person who's been a heroin addict. Mm. Never understood what withdrawal is going to be. Mm, never mm. knew what withdrawal felt like. Mm. Started using it. Um, I remember one week I had bad news. My my cousin had died in a car accident. Mm. I was separated from these party friends now. I was so shocked at the news. I was like, do I have that dealer's number? Mm. Because I never used to order it in the beginning, you Mm. know. I called the dealer. I started smoking by myself, started smoking by myself, isolating myself. Mm. And... um, One day I went to work without smoking. I get to work, I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm puking bile. I don't understand what is wrong with me. I'm Mm. shivering, my muscles are sore, my body is aching. When I get home from work, I decided to call the dealer. I called him when I took the first hit. All the ailments were gone. Mm. At that moment, I just told myself, I'm officially an addict, right? Mm. So, so how long had it been of you doing the weekends and everything? It was about three months wow. of doing the weekends. But then what happened was, so now I realize, now I recognize what withdrawal is. Yes. My first experience of withdrawal. Then I realized, oh, that time when I didn't take it and I was hot and cold like that, that was actually withdrawal. So when I was aware of the fact that this is withdrawal, now I started making sure that I have the drug with me. Mm. So that you never have to so feel the withdrawal. So that I withdrawals. never have to feel the withdrawal. Now it's escalating fast. I have to smoke every four hours, in the middle of the night, during the day, at work, everywhere I go. Mm. I have to have heroin with me. I started going to holistic doctors. I started saying, listen, I've got a physical Addiction to heroin, I need to get off. They give me medication, put this on top of your tongue, put this under your tongue. None of it can kick the physical. It's The physical addiction is so strong. So you actually did go to look for help? Yes, I went to look for help. I went to a doctor. He prescribed something else for me. It was not working for my physical withdrawal. I went to a third doctor who prescribed these pain, these heavy um, scheduled, high scheduled painkiller for me. But when I was using the painkiller, I realized that I, can, I also get physically addicted of the painkiller. The mm. painkiller was expensive at the time. So I would actually relapse mm. and go back to heroin because mm. the painkillers were too expensive to get. Mm. So now, who in your life at the time knew what you were going through? Maybe two of my friends. Mm. Mm-hmm. But I totally isolated myself from my family um, didn't, didn't call as much, always worked. So I was a functioning, functional addict, mm, mm, basically mm. going to work with all my paraphernalia 
and smoking. And I mean, one day, something so crazy, I was shooting at a rehab and I was smoking in the toilet of the rehab while we were shooting. Hmm. So at what point then, like you say, you mentioning, you know, working at a, uh, um, smoking at a rehab, was there no part of you that was like, I should be here? Yes. I always knew that eventually I'm going to end up. I, I remember one day I told myself, okay, so I'm going to be in a rehab. Wow. Yeah. And I was always trying to, because I always said to myself, I can't leave work. I can't, you know, mm. I can't go away for six weeks. Mm. Where am I going to, you know? Mm. I always made these excuses, but I knew, you know, one thing I liked about growing up with my um, grandmother also was the principles. Mm. So that's why I'm saying you always have to keep that grain of hope because your principles can carry you far. Mm. You know, I knew that I had to fix it the right way and I knew that I was going to go to rehab. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you just instinctively knew when you were addicted, like, okay, I recognize what this is and I know what's going to be happening. So what was happening work-wise? Because you say you were functional. What work were you doing at the time and what did it actually require of your mind power? So I was working as a makeup artist. Mm. So I was um, had an extreme love for my job. And I was like, but I had to be a thug, you know? I had to plan how I do things. And I remember one day at work, I would just be like, I need to go home quickly to unlock the gate because somebody locked themselves inside. And then I would go and meet the dealer mm. on the side of the road, make sure I quickly get my hit, run to the toilet fast, smoke, and then just to be normal before, mm. my, before my withdrawal actually kick in. And nobody knew at the time that you were high? No. Like because at work? You get, when you, in the beginning of your usage, mm. you, people can really see mm. when you are high. But the more you're using, the more you need it just to be normal. normal. Oh, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, to be normal. Yes, so it almost stabilizes you. Sta it definitely stabilizes you. Yes, yes. Did you being high or actually needing to use all the time not affect, affect the quality of your work? Nobody actually complained. So nobody said, you know, what you're doing looks skew, you're not blending properly, none of those things. I was in the prime of my career when I was using. I just think my ancestors was really with me. Mm, mm, Honestly, mm. I do, because there's so many things that could have happened to me. I mean, you know, we, when we tell the stories about, it's always like, oh, very heroic stories. You know, mm. it's very um, sensationalized, but... There's a lot of things that can happen to you as an addict. I mean, I could have been in jail. Mm. I could have been dead, mm. you know? So I always felt like I was protected. Mm. Mm. And even in my job, you know? Sometimes I go to people now and I'm like, you know, when we did that show, I was heavy into the heroin. And they'll be like, what? Shocked. And I'll be like, yeah, I, I was an addict and I was an addict that time. Yes, You know, yes, and yes. people are literally shocked. Yes, so I'm glad that you explained that because... Many people's idea and perception of an addict is like you're on the street, you're homeless, you you can't work, you can't do anything. You are highly functional. Very. How were you able to keep affording this habit? Because it's not like drugs are cheap. It's not cheap, but that's what that was the only thing I was using my money for. So I was not getting new things. I was not expanding. So what about the basic bills? I just kept everything very basic. Mm. But financially, it was hard, you know. I remember there were times at that time where we used to get paid 12 o'clock. Mm. From 11 o'clock, yo, I'm telling that dealer, ye, ye, ye. 12 o'clock, you need to be with me. My payment is coming because my dealer would never allow me to take on credit and I didn't have a lot of dealers. So I'll be like, 12 o'clock, you need to meet me at the ATM. Oh, wow. I'm going to stand there from 11 o'clock. Sometimes I have a bucket that I'm going to puke in because I'm in withdrawal already, mm. you know? And I will just be there with a car heater on, waiting for it to be 12 o'clock to go and put in my card and withdraw money. 
so that I can buy my drugs. Mm. And what happened to all the party friends? All the party friends, they moved out of the country, most of them. I just found myself in isolation, mm. started using. And you know, the momentum of it spiral out so quickly. Mm. Before you know it, you're on your own, you're doing this thing, you were a health nut and now you're a drug addict and your day to day, four o'clock in the morning, when that addiction wakes you up, you can be, I can be driving to Hillbrow and telling my dealer, open the gate quickly before mm. I start shouting. You know what mm. I mean? And I can be driving to Hillbrow twice the night, in mm. the night, without being scared. Mm. Mm. And basically not eating, not taking care of myself, mm. not being proactive in the community. Before you know it, that's where you are. Mm. I'm surprised that, or maybe you can uh, uh, let me know, did it reach a point where you now are selling things to support your habit? Or did it help that you were functional and working, that you always had money coming in to keep the habit going? Yes, it helped that I was functional and working. And that was my main focus. My main focus was my drugs, you mm. know. So you, other things become secondary so quickly, you know. Mm. You spiral out of control so quickly that, the most basic thing that you need to have that need to be new or that need to be taken care of. I drove with a car <laughs> with lights that didn't work, mm. you know? So things like that is what I was doing, mm -hmm. but I was using drugs. What, what were some of the things you had to do to get more money? Um, so it was basically pawning my stuff, but getting it back. Like how? Like I would go to a pawn shop and pawn my camera Mm -hmm. Pawn shop was walking distance away from my house mm -hmm. and then go and fetch it and get it back. That As was, in buy it back? Yes, buy it back. Yes. That, that was always my last resort. When I was going to the pawn shop with the camera, I'm like, I got to do this, but I'm going to get my camera back, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got to get my camera back, yeah. And what are some of the other, you know, things, maybe jobs or work that you had to do that, um, you know, was really to, to get what you needed to? So what happened to me is I used to go to this, to work at a strip club as a makeup artist. And um, it was the year of the millennium. Mm. And the boss came to me and he's like, don't you want to take care of the strippers for me? Mm. And I was like, he's like, during the day you can go, you can do your makeup job. Mm. But at night, can you come and take care of the girls? And I was like, sure. What does take care of the girls mean? So what it means is when a client come in and he asks for a girl, he's going to be like, that's the girl that I want to come and dance for me. Mm. You know, I would literally go to the girl and say, get yourself together. Somebody wants to see you. He mm. wants you to dance for him. Mm. Then she would give me all her stuff. I would take the money from him mm. and basically make sure that she goes and dance for him and make sure that she's safe back, back safe. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, so you agreed to, to what the boss was asking? Yes. Because it was going to be extra money? Yes, it was going to be extra money and we had an understanding. Sometimes I would see a guy in the club mm -hmm. and twice happened that I would do his wife's makeup mm -hmm. with somebody's makeup who's getting married and then I see one of the guys there who came to the club. Oh, wow. Asking for a specific woman to dance yes. for him. Yes, yes. So at the time, um, I mean, how far did that job go of you, you know, taking care of ladies? So what happened for me, I was in it for about six months and then I realized I just started coming to my senses and I was like, this is not where I want to be. Mm. And that actually led to me to, to get closer to going to rehab. Mm. Things spiraled out of control for me so fast. I mean, one of the things that happened to me one day was I was waiting for my money to clear. I was calling the dealer. I was in serious withdrawal. Mm. And withdrawal is, what happens to you in withdrawal is your body is aching, your muscles are aching, you're puking bile. It feels like your kidneys are about to jump out of your body because of the pain. Mm. Your joints are paining. Your muscles are paining. I was busy puking bile. I called the dealer to come and deliver drugs for me. He came out of the taxi, 
I could see him walking down my road. When he got to me, he was like, I dropped your drugs somewhere there on Louis Bota when I stepped out of the taxi. So I'm just gonna go down to Hillbrow and I'm gonna get you more drugs. I was like, sure. I watched him getting into a taxi. When he was in the taxi, I was still wearing a fur coat. I had slippers on and a tracksuit pants. I went to get that broom in my kitchen and a scoop. I walked to the corner of Louis Bota Avenue. I started sweeping, looking for that drugs that he dropped. Wow. I was on the floor of Louis Bota, on the ground, on the tar, sweeping for that drugs, looking for it. People came past me. What are you looking for? No, I dropped my chain. I'm looking for a gold chain with a cross. I'm sweeping, with sweeping. A cross. Then I've got the bucket here and I'm throwing up. Wow. The bucket is next to me and people are just walking past me and looking at me. And that was one of my rock bottoms. Eventually I found the drug. I went home. I used, when he came, I pretended like I was still in withdrawing. Take your drugs. Took my things. Wow. So, would, you, would you say that was one of your lowest uh, points? Lowest points. It's sweeping the streets. Sweeping the streets. Looking for your drugs while puking in a bucket in a fur coat with yeah. slippers. Telling people you're looking for a gold chain with a cross. With a cross, yeah. One of wow. my lowest moments. Yeah. So which for you then would you say, were there any moments that were lower than that? Well, a lot of funny things happen. Like low and funny. Like when I look back at it, I'm like, did that, did that really happen? Was I went to the dentist one day, so I went to this, um, I went to one of the government dentists, you know, somewhere where they obviously don't know me. So we went in, it was myself, a whole lot of other um, people from the community. And then the dentist came out and the nurse actually came out. She's like, listen, there's a lot of you guys that are intoxicated today. Because I was with people that were like, probably alcoholics who drank before they came. And, and she's like, guys, you, you have to understand that if you're coming for a procedure, you cannot be intoxicated. I'm high as a kite. I'm looking at these people like, yeah, guys, you can't be intoxicated. <laughs> <laughs> While you're coming for a procedure. Yeah. I'm high as hell. I'm looking at them. Yeah, I'm like, Kanti, I am so high of the heroin. Eventually, when they did my procedure, I was, I literally felt everything that the doctor was doing to my tooth because... You're not supposed to be high when procedures are done. I'm not supposed to be done. high when the procedure is supposed to be done. Were you screaming when this was happening? You know, I could feel every bit of the pain. I was just breathing in deeply. I was imagining that I was on an island somewhere. You know, the tears were literally just running down my face like this. I was just sitting there. I couldn't even scream. I was just laying there and I was just surrendering. I was like, oh my God, she's kidding me. Wow. You know? Wow. And, and she knew at the time you were high. She did not know. She didn't know you were no, high. No, because I was functioning, you know? I looked okay, and I was just looking at all these people that were tipsy next to me, so she didn't know. So when, what was the moment that you said, I'm done, this is it? This is the last time? The last time was 10 minutes before I reached the rehab, was the last time that I used that I could actually say that. Because you know your withdrawal is so overwhelming. You don't think clearly. Hmm. When you... When you're in the withdrawal of addiction or when you are deep in your addiction, for me, the feeling of the withdrawal and the addiction was so overwhelming that I could not follow through decisions. Mm. You know, I had glimpses of like knowing that I'm going to go to rehab. So what had happened was it's almost a blur. What had happened was I had gone home to my parents and I had taken drugs with me. Mm. And um, as I was home with my parents, my drugs literally finished. I went into full withdrawal. My mom was like, what is going on? And I'm like, I'm withdrawing, my drugs are finished. So you told her? I told her. 
My mom said, I knew something was wrong with you, but I didn't know that it was drugs. So I just said, I'm ready to go to rehab. Mm. You know, I'm ready to go to rehab. So we were booking for rehab really quickly because now I'm in withdrawal and we didn't know how to manage the withdrawal. Mm. Um, And then they said to me, we don't have a place right now for you, but we can see you next week. Mm. Yeah, I'm in full withdrawal. You know, my parents are like, what is going on? I call a friend of mine that's in Joburg. I was like, I need you to go to the bus stop for me. Take my album. In the picture of myself, put heroin for me. It needs to last me for one week. Just stick it behind the picture. My friend called me the night. She's like, I just missed the, I'm, I just missed the bus. Mm. I'm like, I'm going to kill you. Because now I'm in the total withdrawal. The whole days, I'm in withdrawal, I'm puking. So there's no part of you that was thinking, let me find heroin here where I am. It's a small town, I, but there was no way. Yes. You know? So eventually the, the second night, she gets it on the bus. Now I'm telling my parents, I'm telling my dad, take me to the bus stop. I need to go and um, fetch this, this album. So I fetched the album and I used. Suddenly I'm okay and I'm just telling my mom, this is how, what the withdrawal is doing to me. Um, I went to fetch drugs and I'm going to use it until... I go. I go. Wow. What did she say? She, she understood what I was saying to her. Yeah. Wow. So now um, you, they just had to follow through with you because what else? Yeah. They didn't have the capacity to deal with it, you being with, in withdrawal. In withdrawal, you know, because they'd actually seen. So what had happened was, so now we're getting ready to go to rehab. I'm smoking my last hit at the garage just before I go in. With your parents there? Yeah, with my parents there. And I promised my parents. This is it. This is it. So I go to the rehab. When I get to the rehab, they ask me, when I enter, they ask me, how many days have you detoxed? I was like, detox? They told me, this is not a medical facility. This is a treatment center. Mm. So for you to come in here, you need to be detoxed. Wow. So I said, I'm actually from Joburg, and I cannot go anywhere after this. I'm going to cold turkey inside. Yeah. They explained to me, listen, you can get a seizure. Anything can happen to you. And we don't have the staff. And I was like... As in they don't have medical facilities medical, and they can't prescribe you anything, anything. to help you. And yeah. this year you cannot even take a painkiller. Mm. So I said, no, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do it. So as I'm walking in, I can just see the, the other patients. They were like, she's high, she's high. You know, and I'm like, what is the big deal? Because this is a rehab. Mm. And as I'm in, one of the girls tell me, no, you... Can't, no one comes in here high. You need to be detox at least for 10 days. Mm. So you're going to die tonight. You're going to jump that wall, mm. you mm. know? And I'm just like, no, I'm not. So by 11 o'clock the evening, my withdrawal start. Oh, I'm with a bucket. It's the bile. I've got all of these addicts around me that's just looking at me. And they're asking me, why are you making a noise? Wow. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Why are you, you know, it was because they were also in their process of yeah. healing still. So they were attacking me. And that's how I did rehab. Everywhere, all the classes I went to, I was walking with a bucket. I was throwing up in the classes. I was hot. I was cold sitting in the classes like this. And that's how I went through rehab. There was no, there was no part of you that had decided that, okay, I need to just one more hit. I can't do this. So I think it was um, something happened to me spiritually when I was in withdrawal. Mm. I, there was a moment where I was like, God, oh, if I'm not dead now, I'm just going to surrender. Mm. If you're not killing me now, if I'm not dying of all of this pain, I'm just going to lay here and lay in this damn pain. Mm. 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 So it was in that moment that 
it felt like something happened to me spiritually. I just learned to surrender and just get through, get wow. through those moments. Wow. You know? And that was, so that time before you went into rehab was your last yes. drug hit yes. ever. And how many, how long had it been in total of using? In the rehab, I was six weeks in the rehab. Uh, no, I mean, before you got to rehab, how long was it in total of you using drugs? I was using drugs for five years. Five years. Five years, yeah. Five years of intoxication, being in an altered state, not being proactive in the community, mm. not having self-love at all, and not understanding it at the moment that I had zero self-love. Mm -hmm. So you did six weeks in rehab, and what was coming out like? That's when the healing only starts. Mm. Uh, you, you think it's like when I'm going to stop using, then everything is going to be fine. But that's when the challenges started for me. Because mm. now you have to reintegrate to the community. I also feel like that's why a lot of people relapse because they do not know how to integrate. You must understand, before I went to rehab, I didn't know how to pack my clothes. I didn't know how to be organized. I had to rework on my principles. Mm. No lying, no dishonest, no not taking care of myself, of mm. my mind, of my body, of my spirit. Now the journey actually starts. Mm. And mm. it is a long journey to healing, but you got to have your principles in order. So how many years sober now? Around about 15 years. 15 years, that's 15 amazing. Years. And what has, you've never relapsed? No. What has, what has kept you from relapsing? principles. Mm. I had to go back to myself. Mm. How did I grow up? What were my dreams? Working towards my dreams and enjoying the journey and never getting impatient. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, the more, and it doesn't mean that you're perfect when you're principled. Mm. You know, you just have a clear understanding of what you would like in life. Mm. You enjoy your journey and every day it just becomes brighter. Mm. You know, what makes you vulnerable to be back in a place where you would even consider going back? Those thoughts are never in the front of my mind. Mm. Never in the front of my mind. The only thing I do for myself is I manage my trauma. I manage my depression. Mm. I control what I can control. Mm. And I accept when I cannot control things. Mm. Mm. So just to bring it back to right at the beginning when you mentioned feeling abandoned, and you mentioned a breakup. Those emotions that opened you up to being in a space where it became easy to say, yes, I'm going to do this. Where would you say you are now with those feelings? As I'm saying, I manage my trauma a lot. Mm -hmm. So I understand when I'm in a situation where I am vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But um, I have other tools now. That time I didn't have tools. Now I've got meditation. I'm training. You know, I'm keeping my mind busy with a whole lot of positive things. Mm. So I don't actually get to that point anymore mm. Mm. because I've got so many tools that I've learned um, that I don't see myself in a place like that anymore. Mm. I'm looking forward and not backwards. So to young people who may be in the throes and depths of um, being down, being low, using, what would you say to them? You know, it's actually, that is actually a very tough question. You cannot persuade somebody not to use mm. when they are not ready to stop. Mm. If it's somebody that says to you, I'm coming to you and I would like to know how I can stop, you can maybe give them the steps. Go to rehab, speak to somebody. But the best thing I can do for somebody that's in the pit is live a beautiful life mm. so that I can show him how good life is on the other side of addiction. Mm. And that's what I'm doing now. And I think you really are the epitome of that. Every day I can imagine is just an achievement for you in the sense that you're focusing on the positivity. Um, like you said, the addiction is not at the front of your mind. You're fully aware that how far you've come, but it's not something that you are avoiding. 
Lebo, what I've realized is addiction will always be my agenda. There was a time that I had not, I didn't want to speak about my addiction because I didn't want to invite people in my trauma. Mm. It was authentic. I didn't want to invite people. I didn't want to be this hero that got, got off heroin. Mm. Because when you speak to people, people have this, you know, I wanted to tell them how low and dirty it was, but people were like, oh, so very well done to you, you know? Mm. And I wanted to get away. I wanted to get the focus off that and I wanted to get healing because, you know, but now I can see that addiction will be, always be my agenda because I, and I was like, how can I help? And now I've started helping by being compassionate to addicts. Mm. You know mm. what I mean? Because I do want to get back into just um, relaying information about recovery. Mm. So having said all of that, having been through all of that, um, what would your final words be? For the addicts, you just never totally throw it away. Mm. You are here as a co-creator of your life. Mm. And when you start realizing, because what helped me a lot was I was, I realized that I'm more than the physical. Mm. It's not just here and now. My dreams were valid. Mm. Everything that I wanted to aspire to was valid. And I came here to help myself. Um, realize my dreams. Mm. So mm. I basically held on to that. So if you hold on, if you have better thoughts, positive thoughts about how you would like your life to be, mm. continue thinking about it. And the only thing you have to do to overcome addiction is just not to pick up the drug. Mm. 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 Thank you so much, Marlene, for coming to share your story, to be so open about some of your low moments, but also just to live the poster, live the example, be the testimony that you can come out on the other side. Thank you so much. Thank you. Not all is lost. And I hope that those of you that are suffering any form of addiction can hold on to that, that there is hope. And that if you're still here, there's a reason that you're still here. And I hope that you can find the help. Details will be on your screen. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Have a good night. Unpacked with Rilebukhile Maboja. New episodes weekdays at 5.30 p.m. on my YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. Television edited broadcasts weekdays at 5 p.m. Open up to S3.